I turn to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 7 and 8 tonight. And remember, we're, we're looking at kind of a theme of humility as can be derived from the Beatitudes where Jesus taught. The first Beatitudes deal with the, the inner person, who we really are, our walk with the Lord. And it deals with our relation to the Lord. It deals with our character. We looked at poverty in spirit. And that's recognizing that we're bankrupt spiritually. We have no spiritually. All have sinned on shore of the glory of God. We are born with sin nature. And we realize that. And in the morning, we mourn over that. And we don't, we don't like it. We want to change it. Meekness is recognizes we can't do it on our own. And then hunger and thirsting after righteousness is doing what we can to search out and find the righteousness of God, accepting Jesus as our Savior and the Spirit of God coming in and bringing His nature into our lives and so that we can grow in righteousness. As we grow in those areas, we turn to God more and more and more. As we grow, we realize our need for God more and more. And so in humility, we, we pride would be, I can do it my way. Humility is... I need Jesus Christ. I want to turn to him more and more. And so we do. As we look at verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The, um, this begins to change away from the inner who we are, character, ourself, to how we relate to other people outside of our life, those that are in our path. Jesus told them, parable once of the Good Samaritan and a Levite and a priest passed by. And, and I hope you realize it by now that a priest was a Levite. They were all from the tribe of Levi. That uh, the priests were descendants of Aaron. Aaron's sons were priests. And the rest of the Levites were helped them with their responsibilities. There were some things that only a priest could do and the other Levites could not. And then there were some things they did together. So uh, anyway, a priest and a Levite passed by a man who had been beaten and robbed and left for, for dead. He was wounded. They passed by on the other side of the road. They said, can't touch him. We're going to worship. Might become unclean. But a Samaritan that was uh, rejected by the Jews and looked down on stopped to meet the man's needs and helped him. And so Jesus asked the question, who was the neighbor? And the answer was the one who showed compassion. And we, when we look at this, we realize that the Samaritan had first had compassion, but then showed mercy. And we might have compassion for folk and not show mercy. In humility, we show mercy. Mercy is expressed when we meet the needs of others. Not just feel for them, but do something to meet those needs. And so... One, one aspect is to meet the needs of others. The other aspect of showing mercy is in the aspect of giving, granting forgiveness to those who have offended us. So when we meet the needs of others, that includes spiritual needs as well as physical. In the early 1900s, there was what was called the social gospel movement, and it had to do with meeting the needs of people. And so housing and clothing and food was made available to people and churches got on board with this and they got so gung-ho with meeting the physical needs that there came a point where they forgot the spiritual needs of people. And, and so there's a breakdown there. The, there needs to be a balance between meeting physical needs and spiritual needs. If we meet just physical needs but not spiritual needs, then, then we miss out altogether. If we meet just spiritual needs or try to, then we miss out because some people are still hurting in ways that they can't accept the spiritual yet. And so if somebody's hungry, we give them something to eat. And when we tell them about Jesus Christ, they're more receptive to hear that. When somebody's out in the cold or, or wet or in the, in the elements, we, we help give a, a shelter and so that there's a place for them to go. And then we share with them about Jesus Christ. Jesus asked, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he loses his soul? And so if all we do is meet needs and we say we're showing mercy, then we lead a person often to lose their soul. We met their needs. They gained the world, but not eternal life. 
And so everyone has spiritual needs that they met that needs to be met too, not just the physical. The greatest problem, or one of the greatest problems in my opinion, in modern church, is unforgiveness. I think it goes way back to childhood with a lot of people. I think it's a generational thing, and it's growing. And so we see a lot of expressions of anger in society in, in many different ways. The result of unforgiveness is broken families, lost friends, lost jobs, neighbor problems, etc. And these are areas of spiritual need. Being unforgiving is not just about the big stuff. You say, well, this is a murderer and did all kinds of terrible things. They, they don't need to be forgiven. That's not a Christian attitude, but I've heard that from church members. Uh, not here, but there was a lady at one of my churches. She got just downright angry with the people at Parchman when we talked about helping send in prison ministries. They deserve to be there. Sure. Well, that was some unforgiveness. But it's also about the little stuff. Those people that do those little things that just kind of grind on you. And it may be a habit they have. It may be whatever. Jesus said, I do not say to forgive seven times, but 77 times. And the principle is we're to keep forgiving, keep forgiving, keep forgiving until we work it out. Keep forgiving. And so there are many angry people, and even in our churches, the anger goes back to childhood. It's throughout life. We live in a society where we all think we're number one. Rules don't apply to us. We can have it our way. We're, we're first. We get the trophy no matter what. And then we get angry when it doesn't happen. But life happens, and it's going to happen. The solution to all that is a spiritual solution. It's a forgiving. That as we turn loose of it, we've, we choose to forget when it comes to our mind. And Satan will bring it to our mind. The emotion will start welling up and we have to remember, say, oh, no, I'm choosing to forget. Forget in that we don't bring it back up. That doesn't mean it is erased from our memory. It's always there. Always will be. Everything that you're exposed to is always in your brain, they tell us. And so... When something comes up that's hurtful, that we have some emotion, bad emotion toward, we tell ourselves, we remind ourselves, I chose not to remember that. I'm going to not bring it up. And then we take the step of we pray for that person that it was toward. God bless that person. And we pray God's blessing on them. And so that's, that's uh, forgiving. We show humility in being merciful by recognizing that if it weren't for the grace of God, I might be that very one that had that physical need, hungry, needing clothes or shelter. And I might be the very one that needs that spiritual help without Jesus Christ, without hope, bitterness, eating, alive, me, eating me alive. And, and if it weren't for the grace of God, that'd be me. And so we look around and we see there are a lot of people that maybe are going through some of this, have physical or spiritual needs, and we need to remember that could be me if it weren't for the grace of God. And then we ask ourselves, is there anything I can do to help? I read the story of a man was, was um, sharing that one day he was in a restaurant and a homeless person came in and he said the man was unkept and he had an odor about him. And he looked down on that man and resented him for coming in to the place where he was. But he said the Spirit of God was there in his heart and convicted him of that wrong attitude. And so then he began to think, well, what can I do for this man, this particular man? And he thought, there's not really anything I can do for this particular man. But they had a homeless ministry in that town, and he started making monthly donations to that homeless ministry so that they could minister to the needs of the homeless in a broader sense. And so God used that instant to help him be merciful in a greater way toward those that he previously looked down on. And so we also need to remember that just because somebody's in need, we don't give them money because sometimes we're guilty of enabling them with the problem that they already have and just make their problem worse. We're called to be good stewards even of our benevolent dollars and we need to use wisdom with that. And if you don't know how, you need to check with somebody. But being merciful may be helping 
some already established ministries that help that kind of need. And it's also recognizing that without the grace of God, we could be in that same boat. So we have a having mercy attitude of recognizing it could be us. And we have a merciful expression of that by doing what we can to help that problem. And so we do. We help. We take up offering for the uh, Women's Resource Center. And that's an area that I wouldn't be good with that ministry. But I can help those who are. And when I come across somebody that is in that need, I can help point them to where that need can be met. We help out with the, um, where would we take food? What's that called? Helping, Helping hands. We do that. And, and I notice the, the box gets full of dried food occasionally. And, and Don, I think, usually takes it over to the ministry center and, and gives it to them. And we help with that. And we can't help those who are hungry, but they can in a way that is wise. And, and it does it in a good way to help them, help them spiritually, and not just give a handout and, and enable. And so there are other ways we, we help. We'll take mission money. I can't go around the world, but I can help those who can. I can't go to other states. I can't go all around Mississippi. And Mississippi used to, it was about 100 different ministries we supported through our cooperative program dollars, which include radio and TV and VSUs and hospital ministry and jail ministry and all kinds of ministries that were done through corporate program dollars that we gave to our state. And then the national programs also that we help out with by corporate program dollars. So we're helping in a lot of ways. I, I could, I'm fairly confident in saying that no matter who calls you with whatever ministry they're doing and they want you to contribute, that you can say you're already helping that ministry and it's through our cooperative program dollars. Because we have so, such a wide and diverse ministry network through the corporate program that we are doing a lot of good things. And as we give through the corporate program, that's showing mercy by our giving. We don't need to say, well, I'm giving. I don't have to do anything. That doesn't leave us, leave us from that, too. What we do is local. Our neighbors, our street, our community, our town. We do locally because that's where we are. Well, in verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed would be blessed or happy. Pure is a word that's used when clothing has been washed, when the chaff has been removed from the wheat, when gold has been in the fire and purified. That's what pure would, uh, that word used for, it means no impurities. It's a life where it used to be we were sinful and that was our desire, but now our desire is not to be sinful, but our desire is to be righteous. And so we're putting away the sinful desires and we're holding on to that which is righteous. It's a life lived for the glory of God and begins when we accept Jesus as our Savior. And so happy are those with no impurities in their inner heart. They have pure desires to know God. That doesn't mean we're perfect. We never will be perfect, so we'll always struggle with that, but with our desire is to be more like Jesus. And then heart is the real you on the inside. Heart is a descriptive word used throughout scripture that means the real you. And we can also think mind, heart or mind, how we think, but it's the real you. When we think about pure in heart and humility, humility would pray like the psalmist did. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And so we recognize that we are not self-made Christians. There's no such thing. There's never been, never will be a self-made Christian. We are what we are in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God at work in our heart and our choosing to go that direction so that God gets the glory. That's how, what makes a Christian. God's Word, God's Spirit, and our choosing that direction. We never do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit in our life. We need God's word in our life. And that recognizing that need is recognizing that I don't know everything. Pride says, I already know all that. I don't want to know anymore. I bought a new lawnmower the other day. It's a zero turn, like the zero turn I had before. And the, the guy that was the salesman 
was going to show me how to work the machine. And he said, well, you probably know how to do this. I said, tell me anyway, because I might learn something. And I did. <laughs> I learned something I didn't know before. And so I wanted to go through the whole instruction speech that he, he was going to give me so that I could learn if I needed to, and I did learn. And that's how it is with the Word of God. We don't know all of it. And since it's a living Word, it's always growing. And, and if you have a garden, you know weeds grow overnight. You have to always keep going back and pulling weeds. When you read the Word of God, there's always new Scripture there. Always. I hadn't read it all the way through yet. I didn't find new Scripture that I'd never seen before. Or it spoke to me in a way it never spoke to me before. And so we don't know it all. And we recognize that. And we need the Word of God. We need the Holy Spirit speaking to us. In Romans, Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the new and of your mind or heart, that by testing you will discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so the humility is recognizing it's not about me, it's about God. God wants to do a great work in my life. God wants to speak to me through his word. God wants his spirit to be strong in my life. I have to let him. So in humility, I do. I let him work in my life. So we learn to be humble by trusting God. We trust his word. We learn to be humble by doing what his word says. Sometimes when it goes against the grain of how we were raised up or what we previously thought. In our humility, we study the scriptures daily to learn what we need to do. In humility, we try to discern how to help those who are unacceptable in society or even to us. But we... Think about what can I do to help others? We don't write off segments of our society, but we try to meet their needs. And the reason that there are segments in society that are unacceptable is because they're unacceptable. They're different. They don't do things like we do. And as Christians, we're called to reach out somehow, either personally or as a group, or through an organized ministry already to meet their needs. And the needs need to be met physically and spiritually. Never forget the spiritual aspect of it. And so in humility, we give ourselves completely to Jesus Christ.